I work on the RHEL security team. Uh, a lot of the work I uh, do is around FIPS 140 certifications, uh, government standards, and common criteria. As uh, part of the work in common criteria, uh, we have to take a look at uh, software assurance measures um, and, and study those and um, uh, explain you know, some, some of the mitigation that we have in place. And uh, the RHEL 6 common criteria uh, did include claims on uh, exploit prevention through uh, GCC and GLibC uh, features. And so uh, what I was wanting to do today is talk you know, some more about that and uh, explain you know, what they are, uh, what the limits of them are. And um, uh, you know, if you're doing third-party software, meaning that it's not compiled as an RPM, then there's these flags that you really need to know about so that your, your hardware is, I mean, your, your software is uh, safer. So the topics we're going to go over um, is the no execute, address space, layout randomization, uh, program independent execution, uh, stack protector, fortify source, and Railro. Um, one thing I was going to mention is at the end of this presentation, uh, there will be a, um, an URL uh, where this presentation and some of the um, utilities uh, talked about in this uh, you know, could be available for, for download. They're not there yet, but they will be uh, soon. Okay, so why um, do we need to worry about these, these things? Well, it's because sometimes we don't see what's coming at us. And um, you know, I bet these guys wish they had stronger security measures, like locking the stairway. Um, most of the trouble uh, started a long time ago with the Morris uh, internet worm. Uh, before that, you know, it was mostly boot sector viruses, but you know, this, this really changed uh, things because uh, it involved active exploitation. Um, you know, it, it had a, a loop where it would uh, try to infect other machines. It had three different um, exploits that it would try on network services, but it would also steal password files and try to crack them and then use those logins in other hosts. Um, it kind of woke everybody up, you know, to um, this kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, once it happened, uh, people didn't think too much about it again uh, until this paper came out. In uh, FRAC issue 49, um, all the way back in 1996, um, LF1 uh, demonstrated how to turn the stack into uh, an overflow exploit. Um, it basically involved copying the shell uh, to the stack, um, modifying the function return address, and then, you know, when it uh, completed, um, you know, it ran the shell code and, you know, you're captured. <clears throat> Just a quick review, um, you know, stacks are um, an abstraction uh, used for temporary storage of variables, um, you know, the last in and first out. Um, the way you access them is through pushing and popping. And on Intel processors, they go down. And normally, you think of, um, you know, like when you do a string copy, it starts at the lowest address and moves to the highest address. So these, these two things, you know, um, are, are kind of in conflict with each other, and that leads to all the problems. If you take a look at this, um, this um, little program on the left, um, you can see there's a, a main function with a couple variables. It calls function one, uh, passing those on the stack. And function one declares a couple, couple buffers and calls function two. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the stack layout. And this was um, determined on an x86-64 processor. Uh, different processors would be different. Um, you know, other processors may push other registers on the stack, but x86-64 has a lot of registers, so it may not need to push nearly as much on the stack. So what ALF1 was, was showing was that um, if, if a stack overflow in um, like frame one or, or you know, function one stack frame uh, happened, uh, he could copy, you know, change, he could change the return address because it starts from low and moves to high and also place shell code, you know, and you know, of course, you know, you would set the return address uh, to point to the shell code and then when the function returns, it executes the shell code instead of uh, the function that uh, should have went back to. So the, the circumvention for this, or, or the, the mitigation, I should say, is um, um, no execute stack. Um, <clears throat> it's available on a per page uh, basis rather than the whole segment. 
And uh, it can be emulated to some extent, and I believe that's um, what, what you have available on the 386 uh, processors is the uh, exec shield uh, stuff. Uh, in order to, to get it to work, uh, there, there needed to be some, some changes to the ELF uh, format uh, where you know, GCC would create uh, some, some GNU stack notes um, and the linker would sell, set ELF flags such that the kernel could interpret those and mark the stack read-write. Uh, you can check any executable uh, with this command, uh, EU read ELF, um, and then grep on stack. And if you look at the second field uh, all the way to the right, it says RW, which means you know that it's read-write. And so, um, in theory, this works fine. But uh, the reality is there are ways to um, prevent that from happening. If you have an, a nested function, and normally these are pretty rare, uh, then uh, you, can, you can wind up with an executable stack. Uh, the, the prerequisites is that you, you also have to pass uh, a variable from from the, the, the outer function into the inner function. And a lot of places where you find this kind of thing might be embedded systems where they don't want to pass a large number of variables and they need to access the variables from within the function. Um, but you know, once again, this is pretty rare. And as you can see at the bottom, when you run the read elf test, uh, it's, it's marked uh, read write execute. The only places I know of this in, in Fedora right now is the Grub2 program and ZFS Fuse file system. And the ZFS Fuse file system was fixed last week and should be out uh, sometime soon. So with, with NX, um, you know, the, the people hacking had to think about, you know, how are we going to uh, do the shell code? Uh, because, you know, the stack is no longer the place where you can put it. Um, you know, you, you could put it on the heap, but you know, the problem is that the heap is marked read-write also, so you can't really execute there. Um, so for a while, people thought about returning to libc, where you could change the return pointer uh, to point to some function like uh, system. And you know, that way uh, it would return into uh, a function that would you know, give you a shell. Um, but you know, this was a, a specific technique of a general technique, which is called return-oriented programming. And um, when you think about it, um, you know, hackers abuse the system. You know, it's like you, you build a house and it's got doors and it's got windows, and you think people only come in and out the door. But there's the windows, and you know, somebody could throw a brick through it and uh, you know, get in ways you never thought about. Um, so what I'm saying about the stack being loosely coupled with the function using it means that um, as long as everybody's playing nice, uh, you know, the stack matches the function. But if there's an, an overflow on the stack, then programmers uh, or hackers have a chance to rearrange the stack to their liking. Um, this is called return-oriented programming. And uh, there's, there's programs out there that you can use uh, called ROP gadgets. And what it will do is search um, everything linked to a program to find certain helpful endings of functions. Um, you don't want to call the whole function, um, you know, in return-oriented programming. Uh, it's kind of like uh, writing a program in assembler language, but then once you've got your, your shell code in, in assembler, then you, you break it up and string together a, a bunch of returns to point to different function. Well, you don't point to the function, but a, a place in a function right before it returns, and um, you know it does the work through a series of, of these function calls. You can you can kind of visualize it like this, where the, uh, the attacker replaces the uh, stack contents that should be there and instead changes the return address to point to the ending of, of one function, which when it ends, then point, you know, goes into the ending of another function, which then goes into the ending of another function, and then eventually they've executed enough uh, code uh, to create a shell, and then they've got you. It's a pretty hard technique to master, but that is uh, the main way of, ex of um, attacking systems now. <clears throat> so the, the mitigation against that is address-based layout randomization. Um, the idea is that every time it runs, uh, the stack address, the heap, uh, the memory map location, uh, the executable, and the shared object entry points uh, should all vary. 
Um, you know, it turns out that um, you, you, for performance reasons, um, it, it's set so that the executable and shared object entry points don't vary, and prelink runs on a cron job periodically and stirs those around so that um, you have the, the performance, you don't have the performance hit of uh, all the relocations, but um, you do have some variation periodically. So if you wanted to test this, this is what, what you would do. Uh, this program up at the top, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but it, it will give you each, each um, place. And if you look at the lower right corner, uh, that's the output of it. Uh, you know, you can find the environment address, you can find the stacks address, you can find the memory map address, the heap and um, exec and shared object. And so if you wanted to test this, uh, you could pull out each one of those uh, functions that, that measures it and write a program. Well, I, I guess to better visualize before we get there, um, based on that, path, that last example, this is how the program address space is laid out. Uh, you know, you got the heap at the bottom, uh, there's a big, large, unused space, uh, you know, then memmap and stack growing down. And, um, you know, so this is, this is how it's laid out. And you can, you can measure this, you know, with that, that previous program. But um, as I was saying, you could pull out each one of those um, one lines and create a, a program and then run that um, many, many times. And what I did was um, create a program that ran 64K times. And then what, it, what it, I did is I have another program uh, called All Bits, which looks to see what kind of uh, bits are varying in the address. And it turns out the heap only has 14 bits of randomization. And in, in, um, what that turns out to be is 8K. You know, so there's 8, 8K different starting addresses for, for the heap. Um, that's fairly predictable. You know, it's not, it's not nearly good enough that, that, like we need. Uh, the execution, uh, you know, there was no randomization, you know, because of, of prelink. Uh, memory map had 29 bits. Uh, shared object, of course, with prelink uh, had no randomization. And the stack had 28 bits of randomization. And what the mask uh, thing at the bottom shows is which bits in that address were the ones that were changing. Uh, to some extent, this has to do with memory alignment as, you know, to why there's zeros at the, at the bottom. Um, so, you know, with um, 8,000 uh, different starting addresses, one of the things I was curious about was uh, would we get an even distribution or is there some sort of bias in the randomization? And um, with, uh, you know, 64K samples and 8,000 starting addresses, uh, if it was a perfect distribution, there would only be eight uh, samples per address. But if you look at this, uh, you know, there's 20, you know, 20 times in that run, it started with the same address. And um, if we look at the uh, bottom of it, you know, you can see that they're all ones, and so there's some addresses that just don't get used often enough either. So um, there, there does seem to be some bias in uh, starting addresses, and this is information that could be used to attack programs. Um, I, I decided also to take a look at the distribution of, um, of, of those to see if, if it was a, a Gaussian distribution or if there was, you know, some clear uh, standout bias. And, you know, it turns out uh, that right around eight is, uh, you know, around the largest, which is what it should be for a perfect distribution. So, um, you know, the one that had uh, a 20, you know, there was only one address that, that come up like that. So while there are some unlucky addresses, uh, if, if you're the defender, uh, it does look like there's some opportunity if you're an attacker. So, <clears throat> Pi is a, um, a feature that uh, tells the kernel that the program uh, is, can, can start at uh, different addresses. And the way that this is, is uh, used is you have to pass some, some different flags on, on the C flags, and uh, also you have to tell the linker uh, something else. Um, there is some indirection uh, in order to be able to move the code to um, any address. And so as the runtime linker resolves all those addresses, it does start up a little bit slower. 
and uh, it does introduce a new writable memory segment because it's got to change uh, the, the mappings of all these addresses. Um, and, and later we'll talk about railroad. Uh, the suggested use for all these, uh, you know, for, for this flag is any daemon or set UID, uh, set group ID, uh, file uh, system based uh, capabilities programs, uh, things that are network facing, or things that might parse untrusted media such as PDFs, office files, um, MP3s, you know, those kinds of things. You can use it for anything, but there is a, a small startup penalty, and that's why it's not uh, enabled by default. But anything that's that's mission critical, you know, you probably do want to to enable it. So this is the way that the the stack is uh, arranged. You know, when the program is I mean, not the stack, but the program address space is arranged in, uh, when we run that program on a pilot uh, program. Um, the layout changes a little bit. Um, things move around. Uh, the heap moves up, uh, the executable moves up, shared objects move up, and then there's a large uh, unused space um, you know, at, at the bottom. So if, if we go back and run that other test and look at the, the randomness, uh, we, we find that, that the heap now has 29 bits of uh, randomness. Uh, execute has uh, 29 bits, memmap 29, shared objects 29, and the stack has 28 bits. And the reason for that, I think, is, is memory alignment. And if you look at the mask, um, you know, they're, they're pretty much all the same. So it, this is a much, a much better um, layout. So if, if we go back and look and see if there's any bias in the, the addresses, um, not really. There's, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty solid. So the conclusion you know, that I drew from this is that the non-pi heap should be the same. And this is uh, something that I've um, mentioned to the security response team that this is something that needs to be fixed because I, I wrote another program that uh, you can pass it one of those addresses and it will try to guess the heap starting address. And with 14 bits of randomness, it only takes seconds to guess it correctly. And I ran the same program uh, with uh, a PyLinked uh, program. And after nine hours of guessing, I just decided to turn the computer off. So it's significantly stronger. <clears throat> uh, this layout randomization alone is, is not enough because um, if there is overflows, they can uh, change the return address and start to use return-oriented programming. Uh, GCC has, um, since about 2005, had a built-in stack protector, um, and it adds a random number to the, to the call frame, uh, that's sometimes called a canary, and it's checked on return. Uh, if it's altered, the program aborts uh, most of the time with a stack trace, and it also rearranges the layout so that um, variables are less likely to get damaged. In other words, uh, arrays are higher up in the frame and integers and, and other things like that are lower in the frame um, so that if, the, um, if there is an overflow of an array, then it would uh, alter the canary and we would be able to detect it. Uh, to use it, uh, you pass these, um, these parameters in the uh, C flags. And uh, there's another uh, parameter, SSP buffs, buffer size. And what this parameter does is it sets the minimum array size in, uh, in order to add the stack protector. Um, it defaults, well, it doesn't default, but we have a default of four in uh, the build system. <clears throat> and what this means is that uh, any array that's bigger than four, well, four or bigger, would get the stack protector. So if your array is like two, then the stack protector would not kick in. And this is just a, a quick visualization of um, what happens if you add the, uh, the stack protector um, to that program we saw much, much earlier in the presentation. And this code in the red is the, the assembly language uh, part that does this check. 
um, what, it, what it's basically doing is uh, getting the, uh, the, the master value for the canary and loading the one on the stack and then exclusively oring it because um, any number exclusively ordered with itself should produce zero. And so if it doesn't equal zero, then it jumps to uh, the section labeled L5 where it uh, runs the uh, stack check fail program, which aborts the program and produces a stack trace. <clears throat> and so that all works in theory, but uh, there are holes in the uh, thing. And I bet this guy's gonna wish he had the motorcycle a little bit later. So if you have, uh, if you use a function alloc A, uh, it's not covered unless optimizations are used. In other words, if, uh, you, if you don't pass, you know, a dash capital O something, then GCC does not uh, produce the size information so that it could calculate whether or not it's needed. And, um, you know, that, that can be a, a, a problem if you, if you were thinking that you were gonna have coverage. Um, if you use wide characters, uh, you know, wchar underscore t, uh, this does not kick in the stack protector either. Um, sometimes when there's character arrays in structures or unions, uh, GCC does not see them and doesn't feel the need to add the uh, stack protector. Um, <clears throat> also, if there's integer arrays, it, it will not uh, kick in either. And uh, sometimes when you pass uh, or, or you use things by uh, pointer arithmetic, it, it doesn't realize that this is an array and it might need um, protecting. For those reasons, would you suggest try and avoid using those things on a stack in an no. application you want to be hard? No, I, I think there's a different solution because you know sometimes uh, you, you just got to use those things. Um, here's a sample of uh, using the wide characters, and if you compile this with F stack protector. I mean, as you see, it's got a buffer of eight, and we do a mem set of uh, 60, and what will happen is this will seg fault, it, uh, which means, you know, the, the stack address was uh, pointing to something invalid, and, um, you know, if you were to uh, use um, read elf a dash s to look at the symbol table, you wouldn't find uh, that stack check fail program uh, or function being used in this at all. Um, here's another sample program, uh, you know, that will not trigger a stack protector even though you intended for one uh, on the, the compile line. If you, what this one does is it creates a character array in test one and passes the address and then test two, you know, totally corrupts it. And, you know, once again, this program will seg fault also. It, uh, the stack protector will not kick in. And this one uh, was just last week. Uh, what, what this program is doing is it's using the FD set. And what FD set is, is it's an array of integers up to 1,024. And um, you know, this was in the NSS PAM LDAP program. And this, this kind of simulates what, what happens you know, because I, I couldn't show the full program of what's really happening. But what happens is there's an event loop uh, that causes a descriptor, uh, you know, to be given. Uh, there, you know, there's a, an accept and, and listen uh, kind of setup, and then it passes the, the FD of the connection to um, a program that do, or a function that does select. And, you know, they're using FD set, you know, they zero it, and uh, then they add the descriptor. But the problem is, if you get enough connections, it's more than 10,000, I mean, you know, 1,024, and so now you're writing onto the stack. And uh, that, was, that was the problem. And once again, the stack protector did not kick in and, and save the day. So, you know, if you wanted to measure coverage of your program and find out, you know, just how many functions really do get covered, um, you know, that's what we're gonna take a look at right now. Um, you might have thought to use read elf, but what that will do is that'll tell you if it's used one, you know, it, it could be just one time in the whole program. So that's kind of a, a rough check. Um, you know, disassemblers, well, I, I haven't found one yet that's good enough uh, on Linux to be able to, to, to tell this from, uh, you know, any random executable. So, you know, the next idea I thought of was, was build logs. And if you, if you add this flag uh, to the compile line, uh, it produces these files called expands. 
And uh, from that, you can extract the call tree. And from that, you can do some analysis and visualization. You know, if you, if you looked in the directory, this is what, what you would find, just a bunch of file names like this. So you could write a shell script uh, that iterates through those and does, you know, a cat of, of the file into this awk. And then down below, you can see what comes out of it. You have, uh, you know, the function name, and then you see what all it calls. And the top one, if you look at it, uh, you know, there's no stack protector. But if you look at the bottom one, uh, there's the stack check fail right at the end, so that function would be covered. And so from, from this, you can do some analysis of just how often the stack protector actually is used. Uh, some sample results from a couple packages you might have, have heard of. Uh, it's got, you know, OpenSSH has a uh, little over 900 functions. Only 134 of those are protected. Um, and the inner procedural calls, you know, there's over 10,000. Uh, Unbound, which is a, a DNS uh, security uh, package, uh, 5817 functions, only 225 of those are protected. So, you know, what I was wanting to point out here is even though you ask for the stack protector, it actually gets used fairly infrequently. And that's kind of, kind of important uh, if you're wanting to attack a program. Or if you're trying to defend a program, you know, it might make you a little more nervous. So on the GCC mail list, uh, there was a patch submitted by a programmer from Google. And I believe he works on the Chrome operating system. And it's called Stack Protector Strong. It's not integrated with upstream GCC yet. But you can download it, and it applies cleanly to GCC 4.7. What it does is it, ca it causes the stack protector to, to be included um, on local array definitions, or any time there's a reference of the current stack frame passed to another function. Because you know, the knowledge of, of the local stack being passed to something else, that something else could corrupt it. So you get a whole lot more coverage with this patch. Um, and it, I think it's a happy medium uh, between using F stack protector all and F stack protector. So I, I ran a test, you know, and counted up what kind of coverage you got uh, with with the different patches. Um, you know, the, the plain stack protector uh, with the strong patch, and then with all. And I include all just to to make sure because you know sometimes in security when when you think something says all, it really isn't all. But I'm, I'm happy to report it really did mean all this time. So if, if you look at it, um, it the, the strong patch nearly doubles the, the coverage of the stack protector. And I, I, really, I really strongly believe that this would uh, harden programs a whole lot. Yes? Can you estimate the penalty on the stack protector check, this XOR and, uh, and uh, jump instruction? So the why shouldn't we use the F stack protector all? Um, I, I want to think that um, there, it, it does cause a, a, a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, I want to think there's a, a bigger slowdown uh, but, you know, from plain to all than there is from plain to strong. And that's the only reason you know, that I can think of. OpenSSH, by default, uh, from upstream, uh, is set with F stack protector all. But we do get bug reports periodically uh, asking why is SCP running slow. And I don't know if it's a stack protector that's causing it, but you know, if we, were, if we had the strong patch, we could change the, the flags on OpenSSH, and we would, we would still have good coverage, but you know, it, it would allow some functions to not have the stack protector. I haven't, I haven't really been able to quantify how much of a difference it really is. <coughs> okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the about the heap now. Um, heap is you know uh, memory uh, allocated through malloc or realloc. Um, from an attack perspective, uh, there's interesting things there. Uh, sometimes uh, you find that there's data structures that have function pointers in them. Uh, for example, xinetd uses this. Um, instead of uh, doing an if statement, you know, based on something and calling one function or another, the, the person upstream that wrote the code decided it's more object-oriented if you place the function pointer inside a, a structure so that the, 
function that operates on it is with the data that it operates on. And that's good in theory, but you know, from an attack point of view, you know, you can change that and, and get control of the uh, program. Uh, sometimes there's context, um, you know, which can, can contain various information about the, uh, the thing that's being served at the, at the moment. Uh, sometimes there's access rights or crypto secrets. There's, there's two basic theories of, of the heap management. One is uh, that there is a management um, set of code that lives outside of the addresses being returned to the user. And uh, you know, it has a free list and a used list, and you know, it's kind of what this is, is saying, is the, the green thing is, is you know, some state engine that you know, decides you know, on a free you know, what's, what list to put it on and when it's allocating which chunk to, to give out next. glibc works a little bit different. It's like this. And um, what, it, what it does is it includes the management and, and state information in the same memory areas that um, is, is being returned to the user. Um, when there's an allocation, the, the OK, it, it works as a doubly, well, actually, the, the allocation list is, is, a, is just a linked list. Um, and it works by uh, pointer arithmetic. Uh, you know, there's a previous size and, and the size of the current chunk, and then the area that's, that's returned to the user. And what happens on a free is that um, it adds some, some information into the area where the user um, used to use, use the memory. And uh, this is, you know, why uh, there's, there's pr potential problems and memory management with glibc. It, it's being smart in that it's, it's not wasting a lot of memory with the management functions, but it, it creates this, this problem where, um, you know, if, if you have, um, let me see, where is it? This and this, these two pointers um, used to be accessible to, to the user. So if you have a use after free, then you know those things could potentially get written to and changed. So you know this is the way the the, uh, the empty list looks normally, is that the data chunk um, you know that's in white is user accessible, and the stuff in the gray is the the addresses that or, or you know management information that the user didn't have access to. Um, normally you know the previous chunk points to the one before, and you know its next pointer points back to the same chunk. And uh, you know the list looks happy. Okay, so you know why is a double free bad? You know I think a lot of people have heard of that, but you know a lot of people don't know why a, a double free is bad. It's because during unlinking, it's going to write into uh, these these two spaces. Uh, the next pointer in the middle one gets written to the uh, to the, the next pointer in the uh, the one on the left, and the previous gets pointed to you know to the previous of of the one on the right, and so you know if if there's a double free, then the attacker has the chance to alter those, and you know that means that they have the ability to write specific contents at an address of their choosing, and you know that's kind of you know what I'm showing here is that you know they can change those pointers to point off to things that they want. This is basically an algorithmic problem. Um, any doubly linked list it can potentially have this problem. And you know, this is, you know, in code, this is, this is what it looks like. The fix for this is that you need to add a, an if statement um, so that what you do is you check the reference. Um, you know, does, if you take the next pointer and point to that, does the, does the previous pointer point back to the same node? And if you take the previous pointer and dereference that, to, you know, its next pointer, does that come, you know, point back to the middle? So you want to do that check to see that everything points back to the same place before you do this. And once they put this into glibc, you know, that kind of ended, uh, ended it. You're checking here. You're, uh, you're, uh, you're you're freeing the block if it's already freed here. It's the wrong. It okay. Have a node in there. <laughs> you're right. 
So I, I got to looking around and, uh, you know, wherever you would find other doubly linked lists. And sure enough, um, there's a problem in um, G list remove link. Um, that, depending on how, how it's allocating and what allocator you're using, it's subject to this double free uh, problem. So that, that is definitely code that needs to be fixed. And if you, you know, were to scan the distribution for anywhere that they use doubly linked lists, you would want to check that to see that they're not just uh, deallocating, but they're, they're checking to make sure the nodes point back to each other before they do that. So I also took a look at uh, jmalloc, which is um, in, I, I believe it's in Firefox. Uh, it, it claims to be faster than glibc. Um, you don't have to recode to use it. Uh, you know, the management is not near the chunks returned to the user, so it's a lot harder to attack the, the state. But the problem is the allocations are adjacent to one another, meaning that any uh, string copy that overflows is going to wind up in the chunk uh, above it. And it does not detect and it does not enforce integrity between the chunks. So that's a real important thing to know about. I also, you know, took a look at it to see how its randomization uh, looked. It turns out that it's got 19 bits, and I thought that was interesting because glibc only has 14 bits. So it's doing something different. Um, I also looked to see if it had a, a bias in, in addresses, and, you know, it, it didn't look too bad. So the thing I wanted to ask about is, you know, a lot of people may write programs like this, where they, they allocate memory, and they do some work, but they, they know that this is just a short little command, it's gonna do something and end. And so I don't need to worry about uh, freeing stuff at the end. But you know, what I'm wanting to tell you is that you really do want to do that, because that is when glibc finds out whether or not the stack is, is, you know, has integrity. So in other words, uh, with these short little commands that don't deallocate their memory, you could have had uh, cor corruption of the heap, but you would never know that. You know, your program may be vulnerable to a lot of things, but if you don't free, then it's never checked to see if the stack has integrity. So uh, the moral of this lesson is, yes, please do this. Please free whenever you uh, allocate. Use Valgrind, uh, you know, to help you find the spots. Okay, um, Fortify source. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, is an attempt to add some kind of uh, checking to uh, the heap, you know, and since there is no other uh, place for that. Um, it requires passing optimizations also because uh, in order for it to work, it needs size information. Uh, it's enabled by default in Fedora and it's with this uh, C flag. And uh, sometimes it doesn't work the way you think it ought to also because you know when you when you pass that command you're thinking well all string copies all mem sets all uh, printfs you know s printfs are going to get covered well it turns out that if uh, you give the define but you don't give it give the dash o uh, on older glibcs uh, it would just quietly ignore fortify source and just not do it at all and not tell you that it's not doing it um, if headers are not included, like uh, include uh, string.h, uh, like, you know, some older uh, software, people decided they didn't want to include it and they just have a local prototype. Um, the reason it doesn't work is because it replaces some of these functions with a macro, and then the macro does the, the actual checking and then calls the original function. So if you don't have the header, then you don't get the macro and you don't get the protection. Um, if a buffer is in one function and it's overrun in another, then Fortify misses it because the size information is not propagated. Um, if a buffer is in one file and it's overrun in the function in another file, then of course, you know, the size information can't be propagated. Um, and also, there's a lot of programs that use uh, Newlib uh, for portability purposes, but I don't believe it's been uh, fitted with uh, Fortify source at all. So here's an example of a, of a program, um, you know, it's not including string.h, uh, and it's got its own prototype of mem copy, and this will uh, seg fault. There's another example of a program um, where it doesn't, doesn't work also, because the, the, function, the size is in test one, and it's overrun in test two. And as we talked earlier about um, uh, pi, 
uh, it, it, it needs to be used anytime you use Pi. Um, because, you know, in order for Pi to work, it has to have some writable addresses so that, you know, as, as the, the things move around in memory on, on run to run, the runtime linker can tell it that, you know, instead of at this address, now it's at this address, and, and it does an indirect call. Um, it, it also rearranges uh, the ELF sections uh, so it's less likely to get corrupted. Um, there, there's two ways of using it. Uh, one is just a plain rel row, which is considered uh, partial rel row, and that's enabled by default since Fedora 18. And then there's also the now one, which basically tells it that when the program starts up, uh, resolve all addresses right now, and then mark that memory section as read-only. It, it slows the startup a little bit, but it is the best for uh, sec securing applications. So with all this knowledge, uh, you know, showing you guys you know, how to capture the sun. And um, we want to define a policy. Um, so for daemons, set UID, network facing, parsers of untrusted data, you really want the pie flags, you want full rel row, fortify source, of course, and I'm trying as hard as I can to ask for the stack protector strong patch to be integrated with GCC, um, because you know, it really does make a difference. No, as far as I know, there's, there's nothing. It's all done automatically. And so that's it. We did make it through <coughs> 59 slides. <laughs> Any questions? I, I really don't know. Um, for some of those things, it shouldn't. You know, like Pi is totally different. It tells, you know, it's something the kernel does. Um, but, you know, it's something you can play with and, and test. I will make these slides available uh, on this URL at the bottom sometime. Slightly sideways to the subject, but um, presumably, <laughs> I'll catch you in the corridor. <laughs> All right, thank you.